Welcome to Listen Here, the audiobook podcast where we bring you chapter listens of our much-loved audiobooks and sometimes special guest appearances. Zachary Levi is one of the most versatile actors in Hollywood with critically acclaimed roles in TV, film, and on Broadway. He's also a champion of the importance of mental health, which he talks about in his debut book, Radical Love. Like many, Zachary Levi has had his ups and downs with anxiety and depression, which were triggered by a wide range of factors. In his raw, vulnerable storytelling, Zach faces the scars of childhood trauma and the voices in his head that told him he would never be enough until he finally hit rock bottom and landed in a therapy center. That's where he learned to address the underlying issues that preceded his downward spiral and heal. Zachary Levi's story is candid and at times heartbreaking, yet throughout the book, hope shines through. He relates the valuable lessons and insights he's learned so that you can rise from the ashes of trauma and pursue a meaningful life of gratitude. Zach narrates the book himself, and today we have a sample for you to listen to. Enjoy. Preface. The book in your hand. The book you have in your hand was supposed to have been in your hand a year ago. It was written, all but finished. Just a few final tweaks and I was ready to hit send. It was, I hoped, a powerful and compelling tale of my mental health journey from the depths of despair and depression to recovery, culminating in my greatest, or at the very least best known, professional achievement, being cast in the title role of the movie Shazam. At that point, the subtitle of the book was going to be From Suicide to Superhero, because that was my story. I had reached the point where I didn't want to go on living, and then a month later, I was back to work with a new lease on life. I'd been to hell and back and come through, more or less, in one piece. I wasn't magically cured. I still had issues to work on, and I was working on them. But I had an uplifting tale to tell about hope, perseverance, acceptance, and, above all, radical love. Wanting to share my experience to help others, I started doing interviews with various podcasts and publications, and a very kind editor at HarperCollins reached out to inquire if I'd be interested in putting my thoughts and experiences down in a book. I'd never once imagined my life being important enough to take up a whole book that other human beings would pay actual money for. Still, given how vital and important it is for our society to address the subject of mental health, I felt that if I could use my story and whatever platform I'd been given to help anyone out there who's struggling, it would be a worthwhile thing to do. I think vulnerability is important. I think it's a superpower. It feels awkward and scary to be open and real with people, but it has only ever brought positive things into my life. Plus, I genuinely feel it's a part of my responsibility to talk about the struggles I've had. Maybe I can write something informative and illuminating, I thought, and hopefully even a little entertaining as well. So I sat down and poured my heart out and wrote the book. It was pretty much ready to go, and the sequel to Shazam was just about ready to film, And then, boom, the whole world shut down, and it exploded. In the spring and summer of 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic hit and sociopolitical unrest exploded nationwide in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. My work and my life ground to a halt, and my mental health cratered along with them. The relative stability of peace of mind I'd fought so hard to build proved to be far more fragile than I had allowed myself to believe. The manuscript for this book sat and sat on my desk, waiting for my final edits. I was so crippled by anxiety and depression, I couldn't even bring myself to look at it. And besides, did anyone out there want to read From Suicide to Superhero and Back to Suicide again? I didn't imagine they would. I picked up the phone, called my editor, and explained where I was and how I didn't think I could make my deadline. But that's not even the biggest problem, I said. Well, what is it? he asked. The ending, I replied. It doesn't work anymore, because I didn't come through it, and I'm definitely not okay. So, the book went on hold, along with the rest of my life. A rough year went by, and now here I am back at the keyboard, typing again. Not merely because I'm in a better place, though I feel that I am, but because that rough year brought me to a place where I finally understood the ending. I came to the very, very, very hard realization that my mental health journey doesn't have an ending. I'm not fixed. I may never be fixed, but it's okay that I'm not. I may never be able to repair all of my brokenness, but I can love myself in spite of my brokenness. I understand that now. 
So even though my journey hasn't come to an end, I have come to the end of the story I want to share with you. Which leaves us only one question. Where to begin? Honestly, we could pick any number of points. We could start with me throwing myself onto a community theater stage to get the love and approval of strangers that I never got at home. We could start with my grandma Pat chasing my naked mom out of the house with a butcher knife. Given what we know about how generational trauma works, we could start in Civil War era Missouri with my maternal great-great-great-grandfather's drinking problem. Or maybe try my dad's side in colonial New England and start with my great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandmother being put on trial for witchcraft. That could be fun. But I don't know that we need to go back that far. This story, the one I want to tell here, starts out the same way a lot of stories do nowadays. It starts with a ping. Prologue. The Way Things Work. Austin, Texas, August... 2017. My phone let out a ping. I reached into my pocket, pulled my phone out, and clicked on the notification to see an email from my agents back in Los Angeles. It was about an audition for the lead role in the new DC superhero movie, Shazam. It looked interesting, but I immediately saw a problem. I knew the Shazam character a bit. As a kid, I'd always been more of a Marvel comic book fan than a DC comic book fan, but even among DC fans, Shazam, or Captain Marvel as he was originally known, is a bit of a niche character. He's Billy Batson, the 15-year-old kid who only has to say a magic word, Shazam, and he's instantly transformed into a superhero, which is pretty much every kid's dream. I also knew that Shazam has an arch nemesis, Black Adam, who's basically Shazam's bizarro world twin. The role of Black Adam had recently been cast, and he was going to be played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson, former WWE world champion and current biggest action movie star in the world. Obviously, it was not lost on me that The Rock and I do not look like twins. It seemed to me like they were probably looking for a John Cena type of guy. I read over the email a couple of times, thought about it for a bit, then emailed back. Aren't they looking for dudes that are at the very least super jacked, if not super famous, for this? I asked. And God bless the assistant, whose reply might as well have been the shrug emoji. It felt like my agency was throwing me a bone, trying to make me feel like I was in the mix for big projects while knowing full well that I had no shot of getting the job. So I declined, saying I didn't want to waste everyone's time. And that was that for me and Shazam. Wasn't meant to be. Was never going to happen. On to the next thing. Or maybe there wouldn't be a next thing. I can say now that this was my real fear. It had been five years since my TV show Chuck had been canceled by NBC. I'd worked steadily since, but my phone wasn't ringing off the hook with major offers. I was secretly afraid that my run as an actor was all but finished. On top of that, while most of my friends were off getting hitched and settling down, my marriage had imploded, just like every other relationship I'd ever had. I was closing in on 37, alone, with no family. I packed up my entire life into a U-Haul and moved to Austin from Los Angeles with big dreams that were going to change my life. Dreams that had given me a newfound sense of mission and purpose. But now I was beginning to question whether I'd made a terrible mistake. What I can say, in hindsight, is that I was suffering from a tremendous amount of anxiety at the time. I had, in fact, been wrestling with anxiety and depression and fear and self-loathing my entire life. I just hadn't known it. I knew that I got sad and that I had my ups and downs, but I 100% did not think of myself as someone with serious mental health issues. I didn't know what anxiety and depression really were, at least not from a clinical point of view. When I finally did learn the depths of their meaning, it was a revelation. Wait a minute. If this is what anxiety is, then this is what I've been feeling almost every waking moment for most of my life. Up until that summer, I'd always managed to white-knuckle my way through my problems self-medicating and finding ways to keep myself propped up without ever realizing how emotionally fragile I was. And when it came to the subject of my own mental health, I was functionally illiterate. Coming to terms with the full scope of my ignorance about my mental health was upsetting for me. I'm a person who's always prided myself on my ability to tackle complex problems and figure them out. One of my favorite books as a kid was this oversized picture book called The Way Things Work. It had page after page of these fun cross-section illustrations showing you this is how a pulley works and this is how an elevator works. I used to sit and look through it for hours. 
I've always been fascinated with that kind of stuff. Even though I'm an actor, and therefore an artist by trade, I think I've always had more of an engineer's brain. That brain has helped me many times in my career, having the ability to analyze how the business of Hollywood operates, taking the system apart to figure out the best way to navigate it. But that same mind was completely flummoxed when it came to understanding how its own inner mechanisms functioned. I didn't understand the cause and effect between the traumas I'd experienced as a child and the behaviors I was wrestling with as an adult. I didn't understand that so much of my insecurity came from outsourcing my sense of self-worth to forces beyond my control, such as whether or not Hollywood casting directors liked me. I didn't understand the reason my marriage had ended wasn't because I failed, but because I was broken. When you don't understand how a machine works, you can't ever hope to repair it. And because our understanding of mental illness is so poor, the ways we try to cope with it often end up making it worse. We don't respond to our negative feelings, we react to them. To respond to something is to carefully weigh the causes and consequences of a decision while understanding our own motivations for making that decision. To react is to let our reptile brains operate by knee-jerk reflex, leading us into cycles and patterns of self-destructive behavior. We explode with road rage when we're stuck in traffic. We lock ourselves in our rooms and block out everything except that inner voice telling us that we're worthless and stupid. We turn to drugs and alcohol to try to numb ourselves. We even do things that don't seem to make a whole lot of sense, like turning down once-in-a-lifetime opportunities to star in major Hollywood superhero movies. When I passed on the audition for Shazam, I told everyone, including myself, that it would be a waste of everyone's time because of the Dwayne Johnson thing. The truth is, it was mostly a knee-jerk reflex of self-sabotage. I had been through so many career disappointments. And my initial enthusiasm for moving to Austin was being battered by waves of panic and self-doubt. With my confidence at such a low ebb, I couldn't bear the thought of being rejected again. If I'd gone back to L.A. and tried out for that job and failed to get it, it would have been a part of my destruction. So my subconscious lapsed into that old, familiar defense mechanism. Let me reject them before they have the chance to reject me. And that's how I let such a golden opportunity slip away. But like I said, I didn't know any of that at the time. In my mind, I had arrived in Texas for a bold new adventure that was going to lift me up and fill my life with a meaning and purpose it had been lacking. In reality, I was standing on the edge of a cliff, and the ground beneath my feet was about to give way. Chapter 1. Stop Running Taking care of your mind should be no more embarrassing than taking care of your teeth. We all need to be proactive to brush and floss our minds, to root out the lies we tell ourselves and the bad programming that drives so much of our behavior. We don't. We do the opposite. We pretend and project out to the world that I'm great, and we're great, and everything's fine. But it's not always fine. And because we refuse to admit that, we do nothing, and all of a sudden what started out as a little cavity is now in need of a root canal. Society places a terrible stigma on mental illness. We judge people for it in ways that we never would for other kinds of health issues. If you tell someone you're physically ill, they say, Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. What's the matter? Talk to me. There's no stigma attached to it. From cancer to the common cold, people want to make sure you're okay. But when you swap out physical illness with mental illness, then people seem to start pondering, Well, how unstable is this person? Is it time for a straitjacket and a rubber room? which makes us ashamed to talk about it. We shouldn't be, but we are. And I was, like so many other people. It took a long time for me to recognize just how much help and healing I needed. When I moved to Texas, even though I didn't fully realize it yet, I felt hopeless and alone. I'd been white-knuckling through my problems for so long, barely holding it together, and I was petrified of what people would think of me if they knew the truth about what a broken, horrible person I was, or thought I was. My marriage had begun and ended disastrously. My mother had passed away, which I thought I'd dealt with, but in fact had not. And my work, which had always been the load-bearing wall keeping my self-esteem propped up, had started to crumble. Even when I was doing well, Hollywood had never been a healthy place for me. I don't know if it's a healthy place for anyone, really. And from the time I started booking jobs in television, even at the age of 19... It was unbelievable to me the way the system worked. Or rather, didn't work. It was broken, 
to the point of being not only inhumane, but also inefficient. Like too many industries, Hollywood is a place where the people in power will do whatever they can, within the law and sometimes not within the law, to make as much money as they can for themselves. And because of that, it's a place where human life isn't valued. Not more than money, anyway. For actors, it can be emotionally debilitating. For crew members, everyday people trying to earn a decent wage, it can be downright exploitive. Within a few months of being inside the Hollywood machine, looking at it with my engineer's brain, I thought, there has got to be a better way. Moving to Austin was an attempt to find that better way. I wanted to build a new kind of studio, a better machine, a place where people who love film and who love to tell stories can live and work and play and find the feelings of community and connection that don't exist in Hollywood anymore. After 17 years of dreaming about it, praying about it, and waiting for it, that summer I finally decided to do it. Searching the country for the right location, I found Austin, which felt like the promised land. It was groovy. It had an incredible artistic vibe and no personal state income tax. I came out with a couple of buddies and we drove all around and started scouting parcels of land around the city. This is it, I decided. I can feel it in my gut. I have to do this. So I sold my house in Los Angeles, put most of my belongings in storage, packed everything I would need to start my new life into a U-Haul, hitched it to the back of my pickup truck, and headed east. I rented a small house in the neighborhood of Travis Heights to serve as a temporary home base while I closed on a gorgeous parcel of land I'd found, 75 acres on the Colorado River, with the hope of finding investors to come on board and help make my dream a reality. Most of my friends didn't understand what I was doing. I'm sure they thought I was making a huge mistake. They were probably right. It wasn't the smartest idea, at least not in the impulsive way I'd done it. Once I arrived in Texas, the initial rush of adrenaline and enthusiasm that had carried me there started to wear off. A work project I'd been counting on fell through, and I started feeling waves of panic and doubt. Still trying to keep up my personal and professional commitments, I boarded a flight for a week-long trip to the Philippines in my role as an ambassador for Operation Smile, an organization that provides life-changing surgeries to children born with cleft palates, primarily in poor and developing countries. I was taking a camera crew and tagging along with a medical mission to make a short film highlighting the group's work. That was tough. I'm an empathetic person by nature. I see people cry and I immediately start to well up. I see people in pain and I can't help but feel their pain. And it's me on a good day. On a bad day, it's a real problem. Even the slightest reminder that pain exists in the world can send me over the edge. So, at a time when I was already in a fragile emotional state, it was probably not the best idea to surround myself with third-world poverty and suffering. But being unaware of how fragile my emotional state was, that's what I did. The hardest day for me was when we left the hospital and went out to the surrounding farms. We visited this family, a single mother raising three children, one of whom had a cleft lip and palate. They were living in a makeshift shanty, a shack with stick walls and thatched roof and a dirt floor. And this woman, the mother, took so much pride in her shack. You can't clean dirt. It's dirt. Still, she had a broom and she was sweeping the dirt floors, brushing away the little rocks and sticks to make it smooth, to make the best home she could for her family. This family had nothing. And at the same time, they had everything. They had a mother loving them, taking care of them. She'd been waiting three years for the boy to get surgery. They lived 90 minutes from the nearest hospital, and she had to carry him on a half-hour walk to the nearest village to catch a buggy for an hour-long ride into the city for the screening. To see a mother doing that for her child, acting out of pure, selfless love, was both life-affirming and heartbreaking because it was something so alien to my own experience growing up. I started ruminating on all the horrible things going on in my own life, which then made me feel even more guilty. Because who was I to feel ungrateful? Oh, woe is you, white American actor boy. You've got so much and you're sad. Who do you think you are? I was tumbling into a spiral of self-loathing, eviscerating myself. My subconscious kept telling me all manner of horrible shit. You're so stupid. You're a fucking idiot. You fucked everything up. You never should have come here. Very quickly, I found that I couldn't cope. 
I was overwhelmed by the sight of these kids, their families, and the debilitating medical problems they were struggling with. Once we started filming, I was stumbling around in a fog, incapable of making basic decisions about what shots or interviews we needed to line up. Luckily, I brought along my good friend Justin to serve as a producer and my brother-in-law Ian to work as our main camera operator. They stepped in to organize the crew. Meanwhile, I kept having to walk off and find a spot where I could be alone and cry. I normally don't have a problem with crying. I think it's a beautiful thing, not to mention therapeutic and cathartic, but you need to have a handle on that shit, and I did not. I managed to hold myself together for the rest of the trip. On the last night of the mission, our hosts threw us a party, and somebody came out with all the traditional Filipino delicacies, including balut, a local street food you can't get in America. It's like a hard-boiled duck egg, only the egg has been fertilized, so it's really a hard-boiled duck embryo. All the Westerners were whipping out their iPhones and taking videos, daring each other to try it, so I did. It was... Uh, interesting. It tasted like a salty scrambled egg, but the texture felt gelatinous and slightly crunchy all at the same time. I got a cool Instagram post out of it, and I'm fairly certain I got a stomach parasite out of it, too, because on the flight home, my gut started tying itself in knots. Which, on top of the waves of anxiety and self-loathing I was already experiencing, was the last thing I needed. By the time I got back, it felt like everything in my life was coming apart at the same time. I couldn't have scripted it to be any worse. It was a perfect storm, literally. Hurricane Harvey hit the Texas coast that week. Houston got the worst of it, but even up in Austin, it was dark and cloudy and pouring rain for days. I couldn't leave the house. I was infected with this parasite, totally constipated, nothing coming out. I could hear the gurgling and bubbling in my intestines as this thing was eating away at my insides. I had crazy insomnia from the jet lag. I was up all night, looking around this empty house, looking at everything I'd brought packed up in boxes, berating myself for making such a horrible mistake with my life by coming out here. Look what you've done, Zach. You stupid piece of shit. You failed at everything. You had it, and you fucked it all up. The decision to move to Texas had filled me with excitement. I was so certain that coming out here would give me renewed purpose. I was sacrificing my own money, my own time, my own resources to give people in my industry a better life and more community and better pay. To help build a better world. I'd been so gung-ho about the move that I even quit smoking and drinking. It was going to be a new day. A clean break. And it was. But it was too clean. I was living in a new place where I knew no one. I was completely removed from my work, my friends, my family. I had no one to support me, nothing to distract me. I didn't even have a pack of American spirits or a bottle of Jameson to reach for to help me self-medicate my way through as I always had. You can't run away from yourself. So there's no point in trying. Yet in my stubbornness and denial and fear, it's what I had been doing for years. Here's how stupid I was. Before leaving for Austin, I'd even broken up with my girlfriend, and she was from Austin. She's a beautiful and wonderful person, and her family lives there, and she wanted to stay with me, but I threw it all away because of all the same insecurities and self-doubts that have ruined every other relationship I'd ever been in up to that point. Unbeknownst to me, all the things I'd given up and left behind were the very things that had been keeping me afloat. And maybe I could have held on if I'd only lost some of those things. But I also lost the most important thing. I lost God. Back in L.A., planning to move to Texas, I felt that God was present in my life. I felt His hand guiding me every step of the way, and I was so certain I was doing the right thing. And now here I was. I'd come to the promised land, and I'd done what He wanted me to do, and it all felt like a terrible mistake. I felt totally abandoned by God. For the first time in my life, I didn't know if I believed in God or if there even was a God. For the first time in my life, I was completely and utterly alone with nobody and nothing but myself. And that's when the bottom fell out. Do you love books? Of course you do. That's why you're here. So we want to let you in on our secret book club BFF, Page Chaser. Page Chaser is an online community for book lovers. From fiction, self-care, spirituality, and more, they're here to bring you what's bingeable and quizzable. Page Chaser's community is constantly working to fill your TBR list. Follow their blog, sign up for their newsletter, or check out their Instagram lives, stories, and reels for sneak peeks and join in on the fun. 
Everything from new releases, deals, and monthly giveaways, there's something for every book lover at Page Chaser. Connect with Page Chaser on Facebook, follow them on Instagram at page.chaser, or sign up for their newsletter at pagechaser.com and let them know what you love reading. Now tell us, do you dog ear? 